The biggest threat to America today, in my opinion, is the domestic loss of confidence in the idea of America. How did we get here? I mean, think about why the Soviet Union collapsed. It was not blown up. It collapsed because it lost its morale. It lost its reason for being. What is the true motive to want to lead America to socialistic ideology? They have inculcated in them that capitalism is unjust. Typically us watching other countries being divided, but today it's other countries watching America saying, what the hell is going on? The same people who say things like, Trump is a dictator, Trump is an authoritarian, are the kind of people who love Trump. The false message is believed to be true because of the enormous power of the media. Who do you really trust on media? When I did the Obama documentary, I was, you know, taking on the most powerful man in the world. A socialist society is a society of misery and tyranny. We're gonna have drones monitoring your movements. If you don't wear a mask, we want your neighbors to kind of call in on you. I mean, think about it. this is the, these are the staple moves of a socialist country. The only question is when something has been tried 25 times across two thirds of the world and failed every single time, what makes you think it's gonna succeed now? If America becomes socialistic, who wins, who loses? Everybody loses in the end. So my guest today is Dinesh D'Souza. He's a New York Times bestseller. He's written many books. At the same time, he's produced some extremely controversial documentaries that have done well. Uh, one in 2012 called Obama's America, which uh, the budget was two and a half million. It did 33 plus million dollars. Another one was 2014 called America Imagine the World Without Her. Then 2016 was Hillary's America. Then 2018 was Death of a Nation. And the latest documentary that's coming out called Trump Card, which I had a chance to watch myself. It's not come out yet. By the time this video comes out, hopefully it'll be playing at a theater near you. With that being said, Dinesh, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Uh, my pleasure. Looking forward to it. So, Dinesh, how did we get here? You know, you're an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. You came from Bombay. I came from Iran. It was a dream for us to come to America. I came here with this idea that my life's going to change the day I come here. I remember the day I landed in America was November 28, 1990. But it seems like a lot of people who are from here see a different America that you and I see. How did America get here? I'd begin by saying that the immigrant has a different perspective by virtue of being an immigrant. So we've grown up in other cultures. And what that means is that when we come to America, we use a kind of comparative standard. We compare America to the country we came from. And we realize that America is very different, in some ways quite unique. Uh, it offers possibilities to the ordinary guy that other countries, even countries of Europe, simply don't offer and not to the same degree. And so we are excited by this. It, it, it makes our journey and the hardships that are involved in making that journey worthwhile, even though we have to sort of start again, start from scratch. Um, but what we don't realize is that we have come into an America that is uh, divided and that native born Americans um, have big arguments about America itself. Now, their arguments are more insular because most of these Americans have never lived elsewhere. They have no basis of comparison. They have no other country to, uh, to measure America against. And so what do they do? They come up with what I call the utopian standard. So the utopian standard is a world, for example, in which uh, no one has any prejudice. Uh, no one judges anybody for any reason. Uh, everybody has uh, not only equal rights under the law, but the same opportunities to succeed in life. Now, most people in the world would laugh if you said these things because they know that life is not like that. We are all dealt a deck of cards in terms of intelligence and strength and speed and looks and all kinds of things. And we accept that as the given of life. But the, one of the peculiarities of America is that Americans don't. Uh, they pretend that the world can be sort of made anew. Um, and the argument inside of America is something that immigrants are a little startled by because we find Americans arguing about questions that aren't even questions in our mind, at least not initially. And my own work has been caught up in all this. I, I think that my political views and my perspective very much shaped by the fact that I am an immigrant. I started out as an outsider. Uh, I've now, of course, lived most of my life in America, but I've viewed with great interest and uh, excitement uh, this internal debate in America about America. So what uh, what caused you to want to write the uh, uh, to want to produce the documentary 
trump card i mean there seems to be a you you seem like uh, i know you're an april baby my dad's an april baby you seem very systematic in your approach 2012 2014 2016 2018 2020 and it's typically election year where you come out with a documentary it's been going on every two years and then your big ones come out during election year of presidency but why uh go from the title of death of a nation uh, or hillary's america in 2016 to now trump card uh, uh to to call the documentary a trump card and have it be around trump yeah, it was a decision I had to think about because uh, I have an accompanying book that is out now called United States of Socialism. And that was the initial kind of working title for the movie. Uh, I think if Bernie Sanders had been the Democratic candidate, it would be a natural wow. title for the film. When Biden got the nomination, I began to rethink a little bit. Now, I consider Biden to be a creeping socialist, whereas Bernie is kind of an explicit socialist. So Biden is moving in the socialist direction. It's no secret that he's embraced many of the positions of Bernie, but there are some Americans who don't see him that way. So I didn't want to make a film where I say United States of Socialism, people go, what the heck? You, you know, Bob, Biden's not a socialist. Uh, I also realized that the guy who defines the political debate, by the way, not just in America, but in the world, is Trump. There's something about Trump that animates people one way or the other. You know, in, in the play Julius Caesar, Shakespeare writes that Caesar was a kind of colossus who almost stands astride the entire world. It's all about him. Uh, it's all about Caesar. And I think right now it's all about Trump. Uh, and so Trump card in that sense, I think jumps right kind of with both feet into the middle of the debate. And that's why we call the documentary Trump card. I love the cover, by the way. The, your picture on the cover is great. But when I was watching it, I'm like, you know, I think this was produced with the thoughts of Sanders was going to be the nominee, not Biden, because I love the way this uh, 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 the, 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 the flow of stories on how you went about it uh, from the original stories to Bernie Sanders honeymoon in Moscow and explaining the gentleman who was Latino with conservatives. The angles you took, it was very, very interesting. And, you know, the, the, some of the characters you brought, obviously, very, very controversial character, the gentleman that told his story with Barack Obama's experience back in the days that got a few people killed. And some say that's the biggest conspiracy theory, where they don't even give it any credence. Some say it is. But again, I like the way you were going about the storytelling. But would you say today, because the one question I always want to ask people who are uh, in your world, and this is what they do for a living, they have to, you know, they study the topic of uh, uh, politics, economy, news, what's taking place. What is our number one enemy today? Meaning, if I am an immigrant, I came to America based on an idea that I saw in movies and what I read in books, that you come to America, you can have any religion you want, you can't be controlled, I can start a business, I can be a millionaire, a billionaire, or just a guy that just had a regular job and runs a small liquor shop making 80 grand a year, and I get to do whatever I want to do, but I control them. I can have opinions. I don't like the president. I like the president. And you got a bunch of these amendments that we signed up for that brought us to America. What is the biggest threat to America today? The biggest threat to America today, in my opinion, is the uh, domestic uh, loss of confidence in the idea of America and in the American dream. Because uh, to me, the American dream and what that um, reflects what it represents uh, is the core of America. So a dream is really about the future. A, a dream is about a better life for me later than I have now, a better life for my children than I had. Uh, and that is this American sense of things getting better. And the second part of that is uh, it includes a dream of responsibility because who's going to make it better? You are. You're going to be the architect of your own future. And that is an exciting idea. But for some people, it's a little bit of a scary idea, the notion that you're in the driver's seat of your own life. Now, when America was founded, uh, there was uh, slavery had been going on on this continent for 150 years. Uh, we forget this because it all seems like it's all in the past. But the founding was in 1776. And the British had introduced slavery in the Americas more than 100 years earlier. So this is what the American founders were confronted with, that slavery was embedded in the society. It had been supported by the British crown. What do you do about it? How do you create a union when you have uh, states that are meeting in Philadelphia and slavery is legal in all of them? 
So the American founders realize if we decide in advance, no slavery, well, no one's gonna join. No state will, will join the union. So the American founders decided, look, let's create a union that is anti-slavery in principle, but that tolerates slavery for a time until we can build the political support to overthrow it. That's the American founding. That was the architecture of the American founding. But the view I'm giving you now is not the mainstream view. The mainstream view in the universities that's taught in the schools that comes from the left is that slavery was the poison that has destroyed the American dream. Why? Because we've never gotten over it, that slavery and the idea of racism that is kind of the cousin of slavery continues to be uh, invisibly present uh, inside of every aspect of American life. So this is kind of why the George Floyd killing was uh, so, um, created such an uproar. Why? Because nobody, you know, people didn't look at it and they could have looked at it and said, listen, the lesson of the George Floyd killing is that we have a bad cop. Now, maybe there are other bad cops and we got to go find them and get rid of them. But of course, the solution to bad cops is naturally good cops. But you notice that the left didn't go there. They went in a completely different direction, namely defund the cops. <laughs> you know, so the assumption of that is that all cops are bad. Now, how can all cops be bad? Uh, the answer is because American society has this built in racism that somehow almost like a virus infects all cops. Um, and so this larger narrative, I think, if it is widely believed by the American people, creates an internal demoralization, a loss of confidence, if you will. I mean, think about why the Soviet Union collapsed. It didn't actually collapse because it was attacked. It was not blown up. It, was, it collapsed because it lost its morale. It lost its reason for being. Same with South Africa, by the way. South Africa had this apartheid structure in the 1980s. It collapsed because the South Africans themselves, the white South Africans, couldn't believe in it anymore. Uh, and I fear that that is a fate that may one day await America, but not if, not if I have a say about it. So, so let's talk about that. So socialism, here's, here's a question I got for you. I don't know what angle you'll take with this one here is, you know, one has to believe that even the people today that are running who are campaigning based on some socialistic ideology or philosophies, these are not dumb people. They know socialism doesn't work. I mean, it's not like even the people that are supporting socialistic ideology know it doesn't work, which means if you're sitting there and saying, I'm running to become a president, my name is Joe Biden. I think Bernie Sanders wants socialism. I think he thinks it's war it works, but I'm not talking about Sanders. I'm talking about a Biden. I'm talking about when Hillary ran. I'm talking about, you know, Elizabeth Warren. Some of these folks know this thing doesn't work. AOC, she's Team Sanders. Fine, let's set her aside with Sanders. If they know it doesn't work, and they know that could be one of the biggest threats to America long term, what is the motive to get behind it? Is it just to get their names in the history books to say, check, I became a president? Is it because somebody behind closed doors has threatened them that if you don't go behind this campaign or else? Is it because a Soros is trying to lead to an agenda to turn this into a communistic or socialistic nation? What I'm trying to find out is they know this doesn't work. What is the true motive to want to lead America to socialistic ideology? The true motive is that um, they are a kind of person that, um, well, let me put it slightly differently. Uh, America is divided into two kinds of talented people. Um, the, the entrepreneurial type is the type that makes things. Uh, entrepreneurs, by and large, create things, they build things, they, they make something new. But there's a second type of person. Uh, this person is best represented by the university professor, but it's a broader type. Lawyers are a lot like this. Clergymen are like this. Journalists are like this. These are kind of people of words. You and I are people of words. Now, we don't actually, now we do create products. I create books, I create movies, which is a celluloid product. But by and large, I live in the world of words. Okay. Um, academics and people who live in the world of words, academics and journalists often think that they are the truly smart people. They are the most important people in the society. And if they look at a guy, for example, who owns a franchise of let's say 10 McDonald's uh, or runs a pest control business, 
they consider that guy their social and cultural inferior. Uh, and yet in a capitalist society, in a free market society, it may well be the case that a professor of romance languages at say Princeton earns $150,000 a year, whereas a guy who never finished college and is running a pest control business is pulling in 500,000. So the professor thinks this is outrageous. This is in fact an assault on merit. People like me are smarter and we should be actually running the society. So this is the kind of person who is attracted to socialism, not because they're attracted to the full ideology. It's not that they embrace the full Marxist doctrine of it. They just realize that in a planned society, which has five-year plans, which has the government running things, people like them will be in charge. So Elizabeth Warren, for example, thinks that she could run the banks better than the banks can run the banks. It's simply not true. Uh, Bernie Sanders honestly thinks that he can run the energy industry better than all the guys in Texas who dig holes in the ground. Those are guys who get their fingers dirty. Um, they are familiar with technology. They know how to get oil out of the ground. Bernie Sanders has absolutely no idea. I don't even think he knows what fracking is. But somehow he thinks that I'm a smart guy, uh, it can't be that hard, uh, and wouldn't it be better instead of having all these wildcatters running around digging out oil in the ground and hurting the environment, doing whatever they want, wouldn't it be good to have a rational planning process that governs all of that? So these guys, in that sense, it is the combination of the attraction of power and the honest belief that people like them are better at running this society than the people who are running it now. Yeah, but that still doesn't answer my question. What I'm what I'm trying to find out is, let's let's focus on a uh, uh, Biden and let's focus on Obama. Okay, when Obama first got elected, the threat was, oh, this guy may be a communist. You guys got to be careful because you know his uh, father when he wrote the book about his father and you know mother and the influence that he had in his life growing up and Van Jones when he was first Van Jones used to be linked to a communist. Oh my gosh, this guy may be a communist. I don't want to go. And then the guy got elected. Okay, I mean he did some stuff, but. Obama wasn't as scary as people thought he was going to be, right? I would say, even as somebody that's fiscally conservative, registered independent, people thought he was going to be, a, 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 lot, a lot of people were worried about what he was going to do, fundamentally changing things. Now you got a Sanders. He is fully fundamentally on a, a complete opposite side. AOC, fully on a whole different side. Like Bernie Sanders probably doesn't think that Obama did enough. Like he should have done this and he should have done that. And secretly, he probably feels disappointed with the amount of uh, uh, social programs that Obama came up with or didn't come up with. Right. What I'm trying, yeah. what, I'm tr what I'm asking here is the following. I'm trying to find out for myself. And maybe this is a selfish question I'm asking. The world knows socialism doesn't work. The, the world knows communism doesn't work. The world knows you can't show a product that was developed from that system. It, even all these countries like Russia and China eventually said, dude, we got to get to this capitalism system to give people to own businesses and have identity and all this other stuff. What is the motive to get the only country left in the world that's the leading country in the philosophy of capitalism? If this thing goes, a lot are going to follow. Why, why would you drive the initiative of socialism knowing that doesn't work what is the motive behind that it's got to be more than the professors thinking the fact that the plumber's making five hundred thousand dollars you without a degree it's got to be bigger than that what's the motive it, it operates on many levels that that's just one level here's another level you've got all these young people and they are uh they are actually living in the middle of technological capitalism but they're a little bit like the fish that is not really conscious of the water because the water is all around them. So their world includes uh, Uber and iPhones uh, and Airbnb and GPS. Now, none of this would have come without technological capitalism, right? If you had left it up to the post office, for example, they probably wouldn't even have thought of overnight mail. It took outside age, private companies okay. like UPS and FedEx. And then, you, then the post office goes, oh, wow, you know, even though the airplane's been around for a hundred years, you know, we can still do that. We can do it now. So they, they got, but no innovation comes out of government per se, or very little. Um, but for a lot of young people, they take all this for granted. They never think about how did, they, how did all these things come to be? They didn't magically fall out of the sky. What is the system that produced them? They don't think about that. Rather, what they think about is simply this. They, they have, and I think their professors are very complicit in this, have inculcated in them 
the honest belief that capitalism is unjust. And in fairness, I have to say that the defenders of capitalism don't do a good job in explaining why it is just, not just why it is efficient, but I why agree. it is just. So for example, if a guy makes something, uh, let's just say, let's just take me as an author, for example. Now, if I write a book and I publish it and it happens to be during the Great Depression uh, and uh, nobody buys the book, the book is, let's say, a failure. And then 10 years later, the economy recovers and is doing better. And I issue the same book and it's a massive success. Think about it. It's the same book. In terms of the merit of it, I've released the same product, but in one environment, it's unsuccessful. In another environment, I'm a millionaire. So the ordinary guy looking at that goes, well, how can a system be just when the same product in two different environments produces a completely different outcome? So this, what happens is young people are, are raised to believe that there's something completely arbitrary about the rewards of capitalism, and therefore they become vulnerable to the argument, hey, why don't we have a different organization? Maybe socialism in the old sense doesn't work, but it is partly you know, the American optimism that says, we can find a way that's gonna make it work. We're gonna find a way that will leave all the problems of the past behind. And so for example, one common thing you hear politicians say is, we don't want authoritarian socialism. You know, we don't want the socialism of Mao and Lenin and Stalin. We're not going there. We want democratic socialism. And so if you listen to AOC or Bernie Sanders, the, they almost never use the word socialism without the adjective democratic. Yes. Why? Because they believe that democracy, this idea of popular consent, gives more legitimacy to the idea of socialism. So they're trying to create, a, in fairness, they're trying to create something of a new type of socialism that hasn't existed before. The only question is when something has been tried, not once or twice, but 25 times across virtually two thirds of the world and failed every single time, what makes you think it's gonna succeed now? Well, so, okay, so socialism, capitalism, if America becomes socialistic, who wins, who loses? Well, everybody loses in the end because a socialist society is a society of misery and tyranny. Um, the, this seems a little hard for Americans to believe. My, my wife is from Venezuela. And so she talks about how in Venezuela today, if you walk into grocery stores, and this has been true now for almost 20 years, the grocery store is completely empty. Uh, all it has is like 100 bottles of ketchup, empty shelves. Uh, so even if you have money, you can't buy anything. Now, if I were to say this to Americans, they, they give me a funny look like this is, this is ridiculous. This is hard to believe. But interestingly, under coronavirus, we just got a little small preview on a temporary basis of what socialism would look like on a permanent basis. Uh, and the other thing we saw under coronavirus was a kind of a, this the beginning of an attack on civil liberties. And by that, I mean things like we're going to have drones monitoring your movements. Uh, if you don't wear a mask, we want your neighbors to kind of call in on you. I mean, think about this. Is this these are the staple moves of a socialist country? Oh. You know, report on your parents, uh, and you never think you'd see this in America, but we've seen little glimmers of it in America in the last several months. Yeah, and you're seeing uh, the the exit is taking place right now with Elon Musk saying, "Listen, I'm going to move my Tesla Corporation and build the trucks and all these other things out of Austin." And even a podcaster like Rogan said, "I'm just leaving Austin myself as well. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go out there and." you know, whatever part of Texas that Rogan's going to be moving to, but he's leaving California because they're both extremely frustrated what's going on with California. You know, the, the concept of capitalism is it, two things becomes the enemy. The few protected by the majority, the majority protected by the few. So if you're part of the few that's creating the jobs and you're very wealthy and you've done very well, you can be bullied by the majority. It, it, how, how are the few protected by the majority. I guess the question I'm trying to ask is the following. So in a sales organization and a company that expands, sometimes companies that are in sales, they flatten out because they want to recognize everybody because they're afraid of losing salespeople. So for example, imagine I'm running a real estate company. I got a hundred uh, uh, realtors. I have to say, well, you know, Johnny's also doing good. Bobby's also doing good. Great job, Larry. Great job, Jackie. Great job, Mary. And competition goes away. So then the guy that's killing it. He's doing 20, 50% of the production. He said, I'm going somewhere else because I need the proper recognition. But sometimes the 82 agents who are not the top producers complaining about the one guy can drive the one guy 
a way to say, I can't be here. You guys are not realizing. I'm here at 6 a.m. I'm leaving 9. I'm working on the weekends. You guys are not. You're bringing in two deals a month. I'm bringing in 10 deals a month. How can I be protected here? My question for you is this. The few who are willing to work their tails off and create jobs and constantly innovate and take this to the next level, how are they protected by the majority in America? So they aren't. And I think you, you've now touched on maybe the heart of the problem. And it applies, by the way, way beyond the economy. It applies in politics. It applies in, in every high school. When I was in school, uh, we had, in, in, this was in India. I was in high school in India. I went to college in the United States. We had a system of ranking which literally meant that in my class, which had 50 students in it, they would give you grades and they would tell you who's first in class and who's second and third, all the way to 50. So the dumbest guy in class knew that he was the dumbest because he was number 50, right? Still today, so it was, still today it's like that? I think still today it's like that. Now, uh, the point I want to make is this. Naturally, a system like this produces discontent among all the people who are at the bottom. And if a teacher were to come along and say, listen, I want to abolish this ranking system. I, in fact, I don't want to have any grades at all. Everybody's gonna get the same grade. All the people who are in the middle and the bottom are in support of that system because it benefits them. It, it does not benefit the people who work hard and get better ranks and grades because their achievement is devalued. And so here's the question to ask, which group is bigger? The people at the top who are doing well or the larger number who would much rather pull the standard down? And the answer is the larger number. It's always bigger. Now, in a school which is run by, let's just say, an enlightened group of, of, of educators, they're going to say, listen, we need to keep some form of a ranking system. We may not have necessarily exact ranks, but we need grades. We need certain forms of distinction so people are motivated to work hard. Same with a corporation. In a profit-making company, the CEO is going to say, I don't care if J uh, Jill and Tom and Dick and Harry uh, feel demoralized. I need to encourage salesmen who are going to actually make the sale. I, I need to create an environment where everyone has a chance, but the people who succeed are recognized. Now, here's the point. In politics, however, it's the opposite. You were asking earlier about people like Biden. So it's dawned upon people like Biden and people like Elizabeth Warren that the people who truly create wealth is a small group in society. Whereas the people who actually want more of that wealth or would rather see the wealth spread around is a larger group in society. So if to put it differently, the, the writer Bernard Shaw once said, any government that robs Peter to pay Paul can always count on Paul's vote. And so interestingly, our politicians have figured out, you take an Elon Musk, what if I were to say, let's just take away half of his money uh, and give it to 10,000 people who will then be the beneficiaries of that. Obviously, there's one guy who's going to be opposed, Elon Musk, and there are going to be 10,000 people who go, yeah, give it, give it, that, that's a more just system. I, I vote for that. So in, although this is a very crude example, in some ways it captures the heart of what democratic socialism is all about. It's all about confiscating from the wealth creators and giving to people who are not as well off not because they're needy, not because of social justice, but because that's how you get their political support. So what can the few do to be protected by the majority? The few, incredibly, have only one defense in a democratic society. Um, I mean, from the founder's point of view, there's a constitutional defense. So the constitution was set up so that the majority cannot raid the few. But the problem is that even our constitution is open to interpretation. And so our constitution has not proved as strong a barrier to people confiscating wealth in this way. So the bottom line is the few can only do one thing. They have to convince the many that this is not a good thing. So in other words, the few have got to convince the American people that a mass ripoff of the few, it will ultimately hurt the many also. Yeah. So it's not easy to do. Yeah, it's not easy to do because the many have an immediate gain by raiding the few and the few have to make an argument that's kind of a long term argument that, listen, if you come and rob my house, I'm not going to want to make new stuff and there aren't going to be new innovations and new products and ultimately you will suffer. Uh, but the many, if you're short sighted, are not going to look at that and go, wait a minute, I'd like to get the free stuff in the beginning. I'll worry about the other problem later. That's a, that's a tough argument to win for the few, though. Because the, the, the few have to 
you have to realize the majority are not uh, turned on by the words of responsibility, accountability. You know, you have the choice to change your life and make it better. It's, that's unattractive to a big community. You know, the, the, you know, I have, uh, I was having a conversation with one of our guys yesterday and we're having lunch and this guy's in real estate. And he tells me about one of the guys who he worked with, whom I've known for 20 years. And I've watched this guy, one of the most talented guys I've ever seen in my life. And he was a talented bunch of the friends, maybe even more talented than everybody. And than everybody. But he always used the challenges he faced in his life with his mom, with his dad, with his family, with his girlfriend, with his wife, with everybody on why he's not winning. It was always an element of blaming somebody else. And what was a very proven tactic was constantly crying and getting people to feel guilty for him, feel bad for him. And it was a mechanism to say, man, that's why I feel so bad for him. I feel so bad for him. I feel so bad for him. And most people don't have a rebuttal to that. I don't know what to say. I don't know. And then I just sat down with this guy and I said, listen, man, you fooled people your entire life, how difficult your life's been. I just have to tell you, man, your life has not as been as difficult as that guy, as this guy's, as that guy. How come they're winning? And we're all friends. How can you say that? What can I say? No, I say, I just think you're finding an out to validate why you're not willing to be held accountable, work hard and be responsible. That's a lot of pressure on you. You want to be able to have an out and you don't like that kind of stuff. And that friction of just dealing direct, you know, he doesn't like that kind of a conversation. I don't think, uh, uh, I think there's a community that doesn't want somebody to say, it's your fault. I don't, I don't think there's a community that wants to say, why don't you do something about it? Why don't you pick up a book and read about it? So again, I, I'm thinking long-term. I'm thinking if you're creating an environment of uh, wanting to develop disciplined people, what are you going to do? You're always going to have a community that's going to say, it's not fair. You're making too much money. You're doing this. You're doing that. How does the few get protected by these guys? By the way, going back to the Indian system, uh, India system of one to 50, how, how did it work out? Are they still doing it? And if it is, what was the energy? Was everybody like, oh my gosh, I'm ranked 29th. I'm going to try to beat this guy and be 27th. What was it like? Did they work better together? Did they not work together? Was it more ind individualistic? Did people team up together to do homework together to be in the top five? H how did that dynamic work? Well, when I was in school, you know, like any system, it had mixed effects. It's true that there were some people at the very bottom and they're like, I don't care. You know, in other words, many of them would say, I don't care about school. Uh, I want to, I just come to school to play marbles and recess, or I come to school to play sure. cricket. I don't care about academics, et cetera. Uh, I, when I was um, young, I was typically in the group that was fifth or sixth in class. Um, so I was a smart kid, but I wasn't that smart. I wasn't at the top of my class. And I remember I once went to my dad and I said, you know, look at these guys who are who are one, two and three. I said, are they a lot smarter than me? Because I, I don't seem to, I'm not even close to being able to catch them. And my dad goes, well, you know, son, they, they actually work a lot harder than you do. And I go, well, you know, I study for an hour or two a day after school. He goes, that's it. He goes, they study for four to five hours a day after school, after school, in addition to school. And I, I initially, I thought my dad was joking. And so I talked to these guys who were my friends and I kind of said, kind of asked them these questions. And I realized my dad was right. They worked twice as hard as I did. So this motivated me and I go, okay, that's it. You know, I'm going to improve my study habits. This is ridiculous. Um, so I began to compete. Uh, so I know in my own case, my psychology was such that having a system that was competitive, not competitive in a mean-spirited way, just competitive in the sense that they, they take all your grades and all your, your school marks, as they call them, and they add them up. So there's no, there's no subjectivity in it, either your first or your second or your third. This is simply a math, uh, kind of a math phenomenon. And I, and I realized I had to work harder and immediately I began to see my scores improve. And, and being able to come to America was the result of that effort. I would not have been chosen as an exchange student to come to America if I didn't, if I wasn't motivated to pull myself up into the top ranks of my class. That helped me get the scholarship to get to America, which helped me to go to an Ivy League college and help build my career. So my point is the motivation to succeed, I think is very important. And we don't want to lose that in America in the name of sort of coddling the self-esteem of everybody. Is that how the system's always been in India or is that a recent thing? No, I think it's been that way for a long time. Now, under the British, when India was a, a colony of the British, 
the British had a meritocratic system for the Indians, but it had a sort of a, you could call it the colonial ceiling. You know, we talk about the glass ceiling. So yeah. an Indian could rise, but only so far. You could be a civil servant, but you can't rise above a certain level. And this is actually what created a lot of discontent. A lot of the Indian independence leaders came out of that. They hit that ceiling and they were like, ouch. And then they realized, listen, we have to create a different society. So the British, in a way, were really stupid because had they created a system where the Indians could keep rising, this would have allowed the Indian independence leaders themselves to rise within the British system. One of those leaders wrote a book years and years ago called The Un-Britishness of British Rule in India. And his argument was that the British are not applying their own principles of merit and freedom and openness and opportunity. They're not letting the Indians, if you will, have a piece of the pie. And he was saying that that's all we're asking the British to do. Be more British. Allow us to have some of the same opportunities you make available to your own countrymen. But the British wouldn't do it. And I think this is part of the reason they got kicked out. By the way, that's just fascinating period. I know it's, it has nothing to do with your documentary or, or what the work you do is no wonder India is producing some of the best engineers around the world on, at IIT and 40,000 kids apply and barely any of them get into the school. It's such a competitive environment. I was there a couple of years ago. I spoke at IIT with uh, Arundhati Bacharya and Divyang Turaki and a bunch of these other uh, billionaires. And I had a great time. I just, I got tours. I went to the slums. I went all over the place. And the one spirit I did feel was a lot of competition. And anytime I feel a spirit of competition, you just know the future looks bright if there's a lot of competition because innovation is going to be taking place. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. You know, the one thing you mentioned, your wife being Venezuelan, and, you know, in the documentary, I believe you and her were speaking to one of the best uh, marksmen that we have, and she was incredible at the way, uh, 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 at what she was doing. They were telling a story about how Hugo Chavez in Venezuela had a TV show. I still can't believe that TV show. Did he really have a TV show where he would go around in the city, cameras following him, he would take uh, apartments away and homes away and give it to poor people? Is that really a TV show that he had? Yes. The, the theme that we develop in the movie is we show the parallels between Venezuelan socialism and some of the approaches to socialism that the left is pursuing in America. And one of those, of course, is to demonize the rich uh, and to expropriate, expropriate simply means to confiscate, to take away the possessions of the rich. Now in America, uh, we propose to do this, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, they propose to do this through confiscatory taxation. So very high tax rates and unbelievably you have people in America talking about tax rates of 70, 75%, which think about it, it means you make a dollar, you keep 25 cents and you give them the rest. And that's only federal taxation. Now, in Venezuela, it's a little bit more blunt or blatant. Uh, and so Hugo Chavez, who is um, now dead, but Hugo Chavez, the former dictator, he's now succeeded by his vice president, Maduro. Hugo Chavez had a television show called Allo Presidente. Uh, Hello, Mr. President. And you'd see him walking down the street and he'd have a bunch of aides with him. And he'd say, listen, you know, take a look at that store. Who owns that one? And the aides would go, oh, you know, that's, that's some Jews. They, they own it. He goes, okay, expropriate it. And literally, his guys would go in the store and throw the people out right then, right there. Uh, and then he'd say, what, what about that store? Who, who owns that? Who owns that business? And they'd say, well, that's one of your political opponents. Expropriate it. So then they go in there, throw the people out. So this kind of thing is, in a way, you could almost call it the, the true face of socialism. Uh, now, no one in America will want to do it this way. Why? Because it looks bad. Um, if you have democratic socialism, you've got to convince the people that you are on the site on the side of truth and justice and the American way. So if you do any bad stuff, you've got to do it behind closed doors. Um, but it's the same thing. It's expropriating the hard earned money and wealth of other people. It represents their blood, sweat and tears. Abraham Lincoln, by the way, put it beautifully 150 years ago. He summarized it this way. You work and I eat. And he was actually talking about slavery. And Lincoln said that the essence of slavery is it's theft. One guy does the work and another guy steals the product of his labor. But what Lincoln might have been very disheartened to realize is it's still going on. You know, uh, uh, the, the, I have a big community of Venezuelans in the company. I was trying to reach out to Maduro to do an interview with him. And, you know, it was very technical. I believe his uh, opponent, the president, I always have a hard time pronouncing his name, Gaido. Uh, uh, Gaido, did I say it right? Yeah, he agreed. And we were trying to orchestrate a meeting together. But uh, 
the, the part that you know concerns me is here's a bunch of Venezuelans who left Venezuela who don't believe in what Maduro and Hugo Chavez did. These are regular people that wanted to have a better career. They love their country, they love their land, but they come here and they're supporting many of the same candidates who have similar belief system as they did there. Now, I'm not saying everybody, you, you and I both know it's not everybody. Yes, for every hundred story, I got 20 stories of people that say, I just want business, I want, I'm a this, I know all those stories. But the majority of them, even though they escaped socialism, even though they escaped the model that they had, they still somehow are loyal to it. Why do you think that is? I think that the majority of Venezuelans probably see the light. In other words, they recognize they recognize the signs uh, of socialism here. They, it looks all too familiar to them and they immediately rebel against it. But you are quite right. Uh, that there are some, including some powerful um, Venezuelans, who don't see it at all. Now, part of the reason they don't see it is they are making the wrong type of comparison. To let, so give you an idea. There have been riots that have been going on in several American cities right now. Uh, people setting uh, fire to the federal building in Portland. And so what does the government do? Well, first of all, the U.S. government is, in its usual fashion, extremely tolerant of all this. If you tried to do this in India, you would get shot. I mean, there's no question that by this time they would have called out the military and people would, would be getting shot. So very few countries will put up with this. But, now, but in America, you do. So the police are basically shooting pepper and putting in you know, uh, a tear gas spray, but they're not harming the rioters. They're letting the rioters do what they do. Um, but from the optical point of view, what do you see? And let's say you're a Venezuelan in America, you see a country in which the regime, the government, is unleashing the cops uh, on these protesters. Now, the protesters are left-wingers. Many of them are socialists. But if you are to ask yourself, which is, you know, which is the government and which is the protesters, they identify with the protesters because they think, oh, wow, in Venezuela, the people who are protesting the regime are the anti-socialists. They don't realize that in America, you know, the situation is flipped. That what's really going on is that the socialists are the ones doing rioting. They're breaking the law and they're not breaking the law because anybody's oppressing them. No one's done anything to them. It's not like in it's not like in Venezuela where the regime is taking their wealth, taking their homes, confiscating their property. You know, none of that's going on. These are people who want to create some sort of revolutionary overthrow of the system. Uh, we're trying to impose law and order. But for a Venezuelan, they could basically say, well, look, that's the Maduro regime. That's the Chavez regime unleashing the cops and the protesters. So this is, a, I think, a complete misunderstanding of what's going on. And that's the downside of being an immigrant. Sometimes when you're an immigrant and you haven't been here long enough and you haven't paid close attention, you're going to make a quick analogy between what happened over there and what happened over here. Yeah. And suddenly you're going to say things like, oh, you know, the Trump administration are the mullahs, you know. And so mm -hmm. you, you haven't thought through yeah. the ways in which America is a different kind of society and protest has a different meaning here. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting because the, uh, most of them that I know, uh, they're hard workers. They're good people, family oriented, conservative beliefs. You know, uh, they want the right values and principles. They just kind of want to be left alone to go to work, but I can't comprehend how they don't see some of the philosophies that some of these politicians are having. By the way, you'll hear the saying, you know, we want Scandinavian model of socialism, not necessarily what happened with Venezuela. What, what are some things that we don't know about the Scandi Scandinavian socialistic philosophy that I think uh, will shock people once they find out how the model really works? I think there are a couple of uh, points that need to be made here because the Scandinavian model is the only socialism that you'd have to say to some degree, it does work. Um, I don't claim that the Scandinavian model is a failure. It works if you are willing to accept its strength and its weakness. Now its strength is that the Scandinavians are capitalist in creating wealth, although they are socialist in distributing it. So this is an important distinction because in creating wealth, the Scandinavians are not socialist. They don't, like in, in Venezuela, one of the first things that Maduro did was he appointed socialist bureaucrats to run the Venezuelan oil company. Now, Venezuela is the largest oil reserves in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. 
but it takes technical expertise to get that oil out. Why? Because it's in the Orinoco oil belt. It's a certain type of, of thick oil that has to be liquefied before you can sell it on the world. It takes a lot of technical expertise is my point. Uh, Chavez fired all the technical experts and brings in like Bernie Sanders types, you know, to run the oil company. Well, needless to say, he runs the oil company into the ground. It hardly produces any oil anymore. Um, now, the Scandinavians don't do that. The Scandinavians are a very entrepreneurial society. They encourage, look at all the Scandinavian companies that are doing well in the world. So they have low corporate taxes. They have no minimum wage. You can hire and fire people for any reason. They have less regulation than in Europe and in America. Um, they don't have any of these, uh, no, in, no inheritance tax. Uh, I think Norway is the only Scandinavian country that has a wealth tax. So overall, and the Scandinavians do not kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Now, they do have a big welfare state, but they make everybody pay for it. They have what's called the VAT tax. The VAT is the value added tax. 25% yep. on consumption. And remember that a VAT tax, any economist will tell you, falls heavier on the middle class and on the poor than it does yep. on the rich because middle class and poor people spend more of their money, more, a higher can you explain that? Can you, can you explain that? So, so if I'm making $4,000 a month versus I'm making $50,000 a month, why does the VAT the, uh, tax, the consumption tax, hurt the uh, $4,000 a month versus a $50,000 a month person? Because if you're making $4,000 a month, you're going to spend probably two to $3,000 a month on consumption items. You need it to live. Uh, right. And so as a result, you're paying 25% of a tax on that. Now, the rich guy is probably spending more than you, but he's probably spending five to $6,000 a month on consumption. So he's paying more in dollar terms, but proportionately, he's paying a lot less because he spends a smaller fraction of his money on consumption. That's why the tax falls heavier on their lower classes. I think it's very important for people to realize it because even the Scandinavian economists explained that in your documentary to say that you, if, you, if you decide to come here Yes, it may be socialism, but it hurts the lower income people more than it does the higher income people because you're paying a consumption tax much higher than the others. And that was very good visual that was given there for people to know the uh, math on how it works. Now, the socialism that Sanders and AOC are pitching and presenting, are they presenting a socialism of that model? And can it work in U.S.? If not, why not? Well, it would work in the US, I think, to a degree if you were honest about it. So, for example, in Scandinavia, if you make $60,000 in Norway or Sweden, you pay a 50% tax rate. So, it's really simple. You make $60,000 or $70,000, write a check for $35,000 and send it in. Now, no democratic politician in the United States will stand up and say this to the American people because they know that the American people would have a heart attack if you were to tell them that they have to send half their income straight off the top into federal taxes. So what they do is they have a different model. I call it the millionaires and billionaires model. They tell the American people, we're going to give you all these welfare state benefits, but here's the good news. You don't have to pay. Why? Because we're going to catch these other guys, these millionaires and billionaires. And what's kind of funny about this too, by the way, if you look at the early Bernie Sanders, he always railed against millionaires and billionaires. But then when he became a millionaire, he stopped. Suddenly, he only talks about billionaires. So if you listen to him now, he rarely says millionaires. Why? Because he has three homes. So any millionaire program would apply to him. So what he's done is he's ratcheted it up. And so now he's giving the people the illusion that, look, I'll catch people like Elon Musk. I'll catch people like Jeff Bezos. I'll make them pay for your house. I'll make them pay for your college education. So ultimately, this is not the Scandinavian model. The Scandinavian model is don't demonize the rich. Don't demonize the successful. We are all in the same boat. If we want to have welfare state benefits, the cost of that has got to be distributed over the whole society. Yeah, it, it would be very interesting. Now, uh, uh, here, here's a question for you, uh, Dinesh. You got a family. Uh, uh, I saw your daughter in there. I think you have three kids, one of your own and two step, but you have three kids of your own. Um, the question I like to ask when we're having lunch with our guys is, you know, my family left Iran. We went to Germany. If Germany was so amazing, we wouldn't have come to America. We would have just stayed in Germany because Germany's opportunity was great. But my family decided to bring us to America. What needs to happen in America for you to say, you know what, I'm out? What needs to happen in America for you to say, I'm out? And if it does get to that point, 
where would you go to? That would be a second option to America. Well, um, I don't know where I would go to, and I've probably come along enough in life that I, I wouldn't make the move. Um, I would stay in America, in part because I think that America would is still kind of worth fighting for. So even if America, in my view, kind of went down, I would probably still stay on the ship. Now, um, um, and I would do it in pure gratitude for what the country has just done for my life uh, over most of my life. Um, I do see an attack on the very principles that I came to America to be part of. So in some sense, there's an attack on that America. And, um, and I'm worried about America because uh, the American dream is fragile. It's fragile in the sense that it, it relies upon people who believe in it. The founder said something uh, very interesting. I think it might have been uh, Ben Franklin uh, or Madison. I don't remember now. But they said something to the effect that, it, that the American Republican form of government relies upon the moral character of the people. And if that moral character is eroded or lost, then the system doesn't really work. Now, by moral character here, they're not talking about religious views and they're not talking about theological beliefs. They're talking about things like the work ethic. They're talking about things like the, the centrality of family and, and the family as an incubator of those human values. We learn more in the, in the educational institution called the family than we learn even in school. So the founders thought that this infrastructure is really important for the country to continue to be successful. That's what made America successful, but we have to keep those institutions to be successful in the future. I think that the verdict is kind of up in the air, uh, which is to say I, I wouldn't bet sort of one way or the other, uh, but I continue to have confidence in that America will pull through. Well, so, so just to push back a little bit, then what you, my interpretation of what you're saying is, that all these documentaries that make someone be afraid of what's going on with America, they shouldn't really be that concerned because even the executive producer or person that's making all these documentaries doesn't think it's going to get that bad where you would want to move your family elsewhere. Is that a fair assessment? Well, the problem for moving is, is twofold. One is I feel like a patriotic obligation not to do that. But the second is I also don't know where to go because uh, when, you, when you say that when you, the term American exceptionalism refers to what's unique about America. So let, let's talk about what that is for a minute. You know, um, when my mom, um, who is now dead, but when my mom was in her 70s, she came to visit America. We were driving um, on the highway and she saw a sign on the side of the road adopt a highway. And my mom looked at it and she's like, what is that? Adopt a highway? What are they talking about? And I go, well, you know, it's this program in America where a, a private group, um, the Rotary Club or some group can adopt the highway and they agree to clean the highway and kind of keep maintain the highway. And my mom was like, well, why would anyone do that? She couldn't understand why anybody would think of adopting a highway. What, nothing could be more ridiculous to her than the concept of adopting. A, so there's something in the American character that takes on this public obligation of cleaning a street, a road, um, and private individuals are willing to devote time to do that. That's a very American thing. You know, or if you take a typical American family with three kids, it's not surprising that one guy is, um, you know, working as a engineer in Google uh, and another guy is selling real estate and a third guy is pumping gas at a gas station. Now, think about that. In India, if you said that, people would give you a funny look like how strange in the same family. Are you telling me one guy is in the upper mobile class and the other guy is pumping gas? Well, but in America, that's normal. In America, it's normal for people's fate to be completely different, even though they come from the same family, they're in the same, they've had the same upbringing and the same socialization. Um, so um, in America, you have mobility. People move up the ladder, but people also move down the ladder. And uh, so all of these are the distinctive characteristics of America. Now, you don't find them even in Europe. I'm very familiar with Europe. I'm very familiar with Indians in Europe. So an Asian Indian who's in London will tell me things like, you know, I'm very successful, but I can even, but I'll, I'll always be a Pakistani. I'll always be an Indian in London. In other words, I can't actually become an Englishman. I mean, I can say I am, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to feel 100% British, but I feel 100% American. And that tells me that America allows the outsider a full membership 
which other countries don't offer. In other words, it's difficult for a Turk to become a German, for an Algerian to become a Frenchman, for a Pakistani to become an Englishman. Uh, and again, that's, that's something unique about America. So if we lose that, where am I gonna go and become a full member of that club? I can't do that in New Zealand. I've attempted to go some, to some faraway place, but I don't know what faraway place would, would recreate, if you will, what I came to America to experience. Is there any possibility that America can lose all of those things that you just talked about? I think that that possibility is low, but it is not, um, it is not zero. Um, and what that means is that uh, that's, you know, you were mentioning the documentaries. I make the films in order to, to fight the trend. I make the films in order to educate people. Uh, for most of my career, I was a writer and a speaker. And then I realized I'm reaching a fairly large circle. My books are selling well, they're bestsellers and so on. But I'm only reaching a certain type of person. Uh, when I make a movie, I stand at the back of the theater and I see all kinds of guys in there whom I would never see like waiting to buy a book in Barnes and Noble. So the, the beauty of movies is that they uh, reach a wider audience, but also the, a movie appeals to the head and the heart. Uh, when you said earlier that, you know, that I tell these stories, that's what a movie is. A movie is a narrative which tells stories that help people not only to understand, but also to see for themselves uh, what the world is like and what the world can be like. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is if, if a Hillary Clinton would have been elected in 2016 instead of a Trump, it's fair to say you wouldn't have been pardoned. And for that $20,000 thing that you were arrested for and you got a felony for and they have it on your Wikipedia, which many others have done and no, no one's ever gotten arrested and gotten a felony for, you probably still be doing time, which means the next time around that a person who is against Trump's camp is elected, you're probably going back to prison. So, so the, the, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm only saying this to say, then that makes other people who are wanting to be vocal about making content and documentaries to say, I don't want to go to prison. I'm okay. Let somebody else like Dinesh take the responsibility. And if he's willing to go do time for it, more power to him. I don't want to do it. I'm going to be okay uh, living my regular life. So it's a form of shutting people up. So, you know, it, 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 maybe the question will be a different kind of a question to ask you. Say Dinesh is not the millionaire today. Say Dinesh hasn't produced many different documentaries, three of them which have done $10 million plus dollars, which if I'm a business guy looking at your stuff, the only one that broke even is Death of a Nation. Everything outside of that, you're bringing back a minimum of 150% to uh, 1,200% return on money. So somebody gives you $100,000 for the documentary, I'm making somewhere between $250,000 to $1.5 million if you come to me as an investor to invest into your documentary. You kind of know what you're doing. Only one of them broke even, right? That's your history. Three out of four have been profitable. So if you're not today's Dinesh, if you're the 32-year-old Dinesh with $28,000 in your checking account, I don't know what you had at 32. I'm just kind of putting things into uh, uh, numbers out there. If you're the 32, you're trying to find your way. You haven't yet broken the mold. People don't yet know you. You're working very hard. You got some money here and there, but less than $100,000. And if, if crap were to hit the fan, would you consider if all the basic values that brought me and you here, would you consider leaving and looking at other options? Well, I would, I would think twice about um, going into um, making these kinds of documentaries because they strike directly at very powerful people. And, um, and I probably didn't realize when I did the Obama documentary that I was, you know, taking on the most powerful man in the world. I mean, I knew it in the abstract, but I didn't know what the ramifications of it are. And by that, I mean, uh, I'm not even just talking about Obama, but somebody, for example, could be sitting in the Justice Department. This would be the Holder Justice Department and go, you know, that guy just made a film that bashes the boss. Why don't we start looking at his tax returns? Why don't we see if we can get his bank statements and see if we can find something in there that he did that we can go after him for? Let's teach him a lesson. And the lesson is exactly not even for him because he probably will get a good lawyer. He'll probably be able to figure out a way. The lesson is for all the young Dineshes out there exactly. to send them the message. So the important thing here is this. By the way, I know, I've always known that if you make this kind of a film in India, you will get your legs broken. 
Okay, so if I were to make a film about the most powerful man in India, uh, I would have to be very careful to make sure that goons wouldn't come to my house and, and break my legs, if not kill me. Um, but um, many people have the belief, and I did too, that that won't happen in America. That in America, you can take on the most powerful guy and you can say whatever you want and you can say it in the public square and there's free speech in this country. And sure, if you did something wrong, the government will go after you, but you're gonna get the same penalty as anyone else who did the same thing. So let's just say, for example, you're speeding on the highway. Yes, you're gonna get a fine, but it's not fair. They try to put you in jail for two years because you exceeded the speed limit. That's not equal justice under the law. And that's kind of my complaint about my case is not that I did exceed the campaign finance law, but I didn't get a penalty that is commensurate with what I did, with what other people have gotten for doing that. So that's the point is it's been disheartening to see that in, 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 at least in the political sphere, equal justice under the law sometimes gets pushed aside. Uh, and fighting to restore that is to me one of the greatest priorities that we have now. So you don't have another country, like you wouldn't say Singapore or Panama or anything else. You've not done the investigation to know if there was a second or third option for America. Like you know how uh, Time Magazine does a article in 2012 and it's a uh, uh, United States of Texas, I think is the title of the article. I don't remember the exact title, maybe United States of Texas. And it shows the fact that uh, for every two people that go to Texas from California, one comes from Texas to Cal uh, California. You know, two go from California to Texas, one come from Texas to California. They're showing all this data and why people are leaving California. Okay, so then that led to a lot of other lists. Here's the top states to be in. USA Today does an article. The worst state in American taxes is California, 50, 50th place. 42nd is New York. Best is Tennessee. Florida ranks here. Texas is eight. And you're seeing all these lists. Well, a business owner is going to sit there and say, why am I going to stay in California, pay the 13.3 or the 15% I'm paying over here? I'm going to go to Texas. I'm going to go to Florida. I'm going to go to a different place. I think the part where we're getting close to is competition creates opportunity. And if competition creates opportunity, I do think the days of students coming to America and taking classes and getting a degree and the days of wanting to stay and not leave have gone to, let me take what I learned here back to my country. It's no longer, oh my gosh, let me stay here. A lot of people around the world are concerned about if America is going to stay the same or not because they're just watching a level of division. It's typically us watching other countries being divided, but today it's other countries watching America saying, what the hell is going on? over there with the level of division. That's why I ask you to question, what would be some of the other alternatives if America, if the idea of America didn't work, where would someone go to? Well, it's a completely um, different question to ask me. Um, you know, when I have, uh, I'm now in my 50s, I've got I family do. here, as to put the same question to sort of 17 year old Dinesh, you know? So if I was, if I go back to when I first came to America, and there are a lot of Indians who are in that position now, and as you say, a much larger percentage of them go back. Why? Well, partly because India got rid of socialism. India moved away from socialism. India today is, is one of the most pro-American countries in the world. Um, you talk to an ordinary Indian on the street, what do they like about the world? They like America. They like what America stands for. They're trying to bring that to India. India is trying to have the American dream, not the Indian dream. There's no Indian dream, but the American dream. So a lot of Indians feel that in this atmosphere where I have my own culture, my own cuisine, um, chicken tikka masala, my family, my neighbors, why would I make that journey and go someplace else? I'd rather get educated there if I have to, but I'll, I'll come back home. So I, I understand and re respect that choice. My brother works for a shipping company that's based in Singapore. It's a nice life in Singapore. Uh, if you want to be, uh, you know, follow the law, and be anonymous and have a prosperous life and have nobody interfere with you. Now, political dissent is a little problematic, but if you stay out of politics and do your own thing, you can have a nice life in Singapore, no doubt about it. Um, but uh, it's not a choice for me, but uh, the very fact that we're having this kind of discussion is kind of telling. I don't think we would have had this discussion 25 years ago because there would be no such debate. We would, be, we would recognize that America is, is unique and does certain things. And we'd recognize that if we want those things, there's no better place to be than America. But the very fact that we're questioning it now suggests to me that we have seen some erosion of that American dream. It'd be interesting for a state in America to say, look, you guys are going a direction we don't want to go to. We're just going to distance ourselves and 
you know, be our own country and, uh, you know, for example, a state like Texas to say, we're just kind of going to do our thing. We don't know what the hell you guys are thinking about. Let us separate before things get a little bit weirder here. But uh, yeah, I think, pe- I think people are starting to ask options about alternatives today. And I think it's a very important thing for everybody on the left and the right to realize that some people are going to consider leaving and some of them are going to be the job creators and a country around the world, just like America, because I think the idea of capitalism only lasts about 100 years. Here's what I mean by it. When, when a person becomes rich, you create wealth. I'm your kid. Say I learned all your hard work, hypothetically. So I watched that and my dad worked his tail off. He was, oh my gosh, he was constantly working. Fine. I pick up some of it. One of your kids is going to resent you. Maybe you weren't around. He was never on my practice. He was never. So you're going to have one of your kids that's going to resent you and one of your kids is going to go and work as hard as you. But the grandkids or the great grandkids, one of them is going to say, I don't want to work like you. I don't care about being a millionaire. I don't care about all that other stuff. And they're going to be, have everything handed to them. Then eventually the concept of hard work and, you know, industrious and all this other stuff goes away because somebody eventually got the handouts and the family, the grandkid or the great grandkid that gets the handout screws up the entire legacy, of the family, right? I look at that. If America was a family, you know, the original founders created this great country and all this other stuff. And that money capitalism worked hundred years, 150 years from 1903 1910, 1920. Now we're like, well, let us use the money. Let's introduce taxes, all this other stuff. So I don't know. I don't know what direction this is going to go. You know, the one thing I do want to ask you about is I had John Perkins on yesterday. I don't know if you know who John Perkins is. He's the author of The Economic Hitman. Maybe you remember the first book that he wrote, Economic Hitman, sold a few million copies in 39 different languages. And he wrote the new one. And I had him on. I asked him a lot of different questions. I said, what's the business model of what you did as an economic hitman when you worked for a company that worked directly with the NSA? Here's what he said. He said, I would go to a country that had natural resources, and here's what I would do. Number one, we'd set up a meeting with the PM or the Ministry of Finance. He says, we'd have the meeting. Number two, I tell them, look, I represent XYZ. How about if I go to World Bank and I raise $5 billion? It's a loan to you. With that loan, we get GM, GE, whoever, whatever big company to come and build a plant here and create jobs for you. You pay that $5 billion loan. And on top of that, any of your kids, if they want to go to Harvard, Yale, Brown, we'll receive them. We'll give them full ride scholarship. Don't worry about it. And we'll give this much money to your brother, to your cousin, to your sister. We'll take care of them. Then they say, very interesting. Then they say, by the way, If you say no to this, I just want to remind you what happened to John Doe, the leader of Indonesia, and to such and such, the leader of uh, Colombia. Look what happened to these guys. I'm just not saying we're going to do that to you, but look what happened to them because they said no. So what would you like to do? Then the person's coordinator saying, okay, I'll do it. The two people that said no to him, they were killed. Everybody else said yes to him. Then eventually they come in, they build the infrastructure. The country's paying the loan. They default on the loan. Then the country comes in and says, we're going to take away your oil. We're going to take away this and we get the resources, right? That's what he calls the economic hitman. Okay. The question I asked is, how much of that business model is being used from a China to people like McConnell and Biden? How much of a model like that is being used of economic hitmen that are coming and saying, we'll give you one and a half billion dollars to this venture capital fund and pay $50,000 a month on XYZ, or we understand your wife's father owns a big construction company, you know, wink, wink, just don't bash us a lot, leave us alone, let us do what we're doing. How much of that is being used today against American politicians, not the other way around? Well, the answer is um, a lot. And we see this, um, this is what the Ukraine scandal was all about involving the Biden family. Think about it. We're not even dealing with Russia or China. We're dealing with a small country, Ukraine. And what does Ukraine do? The moment that Joe Biden has made the point man for Ukraine, the Ukrainian energy company called Burisma immediately puts Hunter Biden, his son, on the board and starts paying Hunter Biden and his partner $100,000, $83,000 a month. $83,000. $83,000. And this is a guy with no background in energy, no background in the Ukraine. So what's going on here is that in other countries where corruption, by the way, is, is normal, they realize that when you are dealing with America, you cannot give money to Joe Biden. Because if you give money to Joe Biden, he has to declare it. 
He's under all kinds of, of requirements to declare. But his brother, James Biden, is not. His other brother, Frank Biden, is not. And his son, Hunter Biden, is not. So other countries are smart enough to figure out, listen, don't do deals with Joe Biden. It's going to be corrupt and we're going to be involved in a major corruption scandal. Do deals with family members of American politicians. Obviously, we can then expect favorable treatment from those politicians. So this is a very dirty business. Um, and part of the reason they get away with it is that the American politicians are willing to play along. And so we've seen in America, politicians grow enormously rich from politics. Uh, this never used to be the case, by the way. I mean, FDR was a rich man, so were the Kennedys, but nobody would claim that, um, you know, that Jimmy Carter got rich from politics. Nobody would claim that, that um, Ronald Reagan got rich from politics or even Truman. But we have seen the net worth of the Clintons basically went from zero to $200 million. Of the Bidens, zero to $100 million. Al Gore has $100 million. And again, the point to make is that, you know, it's one thing if these guys started a business, they made a product that no one thought of, they were very successful with some new innovation, but no, they've done none of this. They've produced nothing. What they've done is they have sold access to their political connections and they're, make, they're doing it for a big wad of cash. So this is an example of how America is now becoming more like the rest of the world, which is to say corruption is a normal way of doing business, the business of politics. Let, let me ask you this other question, So, which is kind of along the lines uh, of that. Uh, uh, there are assassinations, which is a Kennedy, a Lincoln, an attempt on Reagan, and uh, uh, one many, many years ago that most people don't know about. It's been four of them, three of them successful, one of them wasn't, right? There is the, you know, very uh, uh, traditional, like when I say traditional, it's what's happened. It's assassination. You come, you take someone's life, and boom. This person's too controversial. Lincoln, you're not allowing us to make money. You're hurting us because these slaves are allowing us to do a lot of other things. Listen, we don't like you. You're the first Republican president. We got to take this guy out. Uh, hey, John F. Kennedy, we kind of don't like what you're doing. Hey, you guys want to go from uh, oil standard to gold standard and feds and all this other stuff. Look, you're going to hurt a lot of us. We're not cool with that. We got to do something over here. Hey, you know, Ronald Reagan, what are you doing with all this other stuff you're dealing with? Hey, you can't be doing this. Okay, let's just say those assassination attempts were made. What, what are some other methods of assassination that doesn't have to do with killing a president? And the reason why I'm asking this question is because sometimes, and I know this is going to sound like a strange comment to make, sometimes a direct assassination is a lot less painful on the legacy than a, another method of assassination. From you being somebody that studied history of what the games that are being played politically what are some methods of assassination that could take place with our existing president? Well, you've actually said something very profound, which is that assassination, weirdly, tends to improve your historical reputation. Um, Kennedy, for example, was in for not even two years, I don't believe. Uh, and we, the whole myth of Camelot, you know, assassination created the myth of the Kennedys, the legend of the Kennedys, if you will. Uh, to some degree, that's also true of Lincoln. Lincoln was very controversial when he was president. He barely got um, elected. Uh, and then his reelection was also a big open question until, you know, until the, he won some military victories right before election day. Um, and it was assassination that turned Lincoln into sort of the, the legend that he, he became. Now, I think today, the more common technique of, of going after someone is ultimately uh, to blacken their name, uh, to use what can be called the deep state. And I want to be precise about this because I'm not, I'm not talking about any kind of conspiracy theory. So we have in America these police agencies of the government. Let's name some of them. The FBI, the CIA, uh, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, uh, the IRS. So these agencies are set up to do something, which is to neutrally and fairly enforce the law. So for example, you think of the FBI as, as tracking down criminals. But what if you could get some criminals into the FBI at the top level, so that instead of being thugs on the street, you have thugs with badges, thugs running the very agency that is supposed to go after the thugs. Now, this is a very dangerous situation because now they have the power of the badge 
and the power of arrest and the power of, of the authority to indict, and they can go after their political opponents. So this would be a form of, I would call it political assassination because it's not intended to kill you, but it's intended to destroy your career, destroy your credibility, um, uh, maybe put you into handcuffs, uh, but put you out of commission. I think to be honest, my own case was intended somewhat like that. It was not ultimately intended to, uh, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to lock me up. They want to discredit me. They want me not to be a public figure speaking out. They want to uh, isolate me from my own supporters and fans. Uh, and that is the purpose of this political hit. So we've seen more of that in recent years, a very disturbing trend, the corruption of the police agencies of government at the high level. Now the ordinary FBI agent is fine. He's just doing his job, just like the ordinary cop is doing his job for the most part. But when it's corrupt at the high level, it's very important to root that out. Okay, so you got political assassination, character assassination, what other models are there? Financial assassination. Uh, and that is that can be done by and large through the mechanism of the lawsuit. So for example, let's just say you're a business guy. Uh, a company will come to you or so a left-wing organization will come to you and say, listen, you've got to give a million dollars to Black Lives Matter. And you go, why? They go, because if you don't, we'll accuse you of being a racist or we will file a civil rights lawsuit against you. So what happens is companies live in the terror uh, of not only the actual financial cost of the lawsuit, uh, but also the reputational cost that will make you stigmatize, will put a scarlet letter on you, if you will. And so it turns you into a coward. You basically go, okay, well, here's a check. You know, uh, you fill in the amount. Uh, or what do you want me to say? I'll take a knee, I'll do this. So all of this is, is a sign of people. Uh, and and when, when fear governs a society, people are turned into worms. I mean, you've seen this in Iran, um, and it occurs in many other countries in the world. Intimidation is used as a regular tactic to keep the citizenry cowed. Cowed means you're up against the wall, uh, and you won't dare to do something that will, that will cause trouble for the people in power. So we got political character and financial. And by the way, part of the financial could also be taxes and IRS, which we've seen that as well. But, you know, I, the reason why I'm asking this is, you know, you're seeing a lot of that, but you're probably seeing them more today than ever before. And one has to know if you get into politics, this is, you know, for the risk that you could see. So if they can't, there seems to me, the, to, there seems to be this desire that we have to do whatever we can to get this man out of the White House, whatever we can to get this man out of the White House. When I see that, I didn't see that with uh, George W. Bush. I didn't see that with Bill Clinton on a second term. I didn't see that with Obama on a second term. You know, just kind of, yeah, well, you know, we got to make sure Romney wins. No, he lost. Okay, Bill, you know, Bill O'Reilly and uh, Dennis Miller went on a tour talking about what happened, or John Stewart and Bill O'Reilly were debating. Oh, no, we got to get, you know, Bush out because you guys got to be careful about what happens. Yeah, okay, Al Gortman, fine, no problem. But it wasn't like this. What is it about Trump? that is gotten people that passionate to get them out? Is it because Trump's gonna do something on second term with this QAnon that you're hearing about a, you know, secret organization ran by two military former generals that are gonna bring out the deep state? Is it because of what you're hearing about with Epstein that maybe some things are gonna be revealed that two politicians video with Jelaine Maxwell that if it comes out, is it because Roe versus Wade? Is it because of, you know, Obamacare? Is it, what, is, what is the biggest thing where you're seeing this level of passion to say, we got, is, is it fear? Is it something we don't know? What do you think it is? You know, I, I think it's, it's a very, um, the reason it's so strange, the phenomenon you're describing, um, we call it Trump derangement syndrome. You know, this kind of virus of, of um, losing your mind when the name Trump comes up. What makes it even doubly strange is many of the people who, who suffer the most acute cases of Trump derangement syndrome were massive Donald Trump fans in the old days. In other words, the same people who say things like Trump is a dictator, Trump is an authoritarian, are the kind of people who love Trump 
uh, when Trump would show up on Larry King and Trump was on The Apprentice and rappers were writing songs about Trump and Trump was, you know, there with Al Sharpton marching down, you know, Fifth Avenue. So the irony about Trump is it's not that he's an unknown guy who's like come out of nowhere and, and people are really scared. This is a guy who's been a staple of American popular culture for 30 years. He's been a figure that most of us, I mean, people in America have grown up with Trump. Right. And and there's something very all American about Trump. I mean, even his weaknesses are very all American. He's got a he's like that kid who grew up in Queens where, you know, even if you are some unimportant guy, if you attack him, he has to attack you back. You know, he's he's just got that scrappy New York personality, which is so recognizable to anyone who lives in the city. Um, this, so this is Trump. He, he is who he is. Um, and I think that Americans didn't expect a guy like him. Um, and he does threaten a lot of the conventional ways of doing business in America and doing politics in America, uh, even in the Republican Party. This is the, the, the source of the so-called never Trump movement. It's Republicans who thought that they had figured out a kind of a comfortable way of doing business. And it's almost like bringing in a new CEO into a company who comes in and goes, the reason we've been losing money is a lot of you aren't doing your job and I'm going to be shaking things up from the inside and immediately there's an effort to get rid of the guy because he poses such a lethal threat to all the comfortable, you know, nuclei of power that have established themselves. All the competing fiefdoms go, oh, wow, you know, here's a new guy in charge and we got to push him out before he does any more damage. I wonder if it's just that. That's what I wonder. I wonder if it's just that because to me that happens all the time. So the new CEO comes, he fires a bunch of people, he brings his own team. The old guys work and still stay in contact with the employees that are working at the home office and they bicker and bitch and some people still have some kind of a control. And then eventually they're over it because they have new problems and a year later, two years later, everybody moves on, right? But this is different. I mean, you have to agree that this isn't just a guy coming in to, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. And, uh, uh, it, you know, I'm a business guy. I'm not a guy that's in the world to know everything, to really dig deep and investigate, to know what really is the reason why people are so afraid of him. What is it? You know, are we going to find out on the second term? I don't know. I don't know what's going on over there, but I'm, uh, I'm just curious, curious to know what it is. Well, the surface explanations don't make sense because you listen to people who say on MSNBC, you know, Trump is an authoritarian. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, Trump is bashed on every platform, every second of every day, right? If you tried to do that to say Mussolini, what would happen to you? First of all, goons would show up at CNN, they would beat everybody up and shut the place down. That would be the end of it. One time you do it and then that's the last time. But with Trump, it's not the case. I mean, with Trump, people are speaking out with no fear. People are rioting with no fear. People are pulling down public monuments with no fear. So whatever Trump is, he's not an authoritarian. Um, and um, so I think you're right. There is something deeper going on, something that is a combination of, I mean, I think you mentioned some of the factors, Roe versus Wade, that's part of it, because there is a worry that the court, the balance of the court will shift. I don't think it's going to shift that much, at least not, not anytime soon. Look at the way that, that Roberts, for example, has now taken on the Kennedy role of being the swing vote. Um, so it's not obvious that the court is going to dramatically swing one way or the other. It's kind of precariously in the middle, which it has been for 25 years. Uh, but Trump gets him in a way nobody does. Um, he has an effect on people that it has to, it almost has to be seen to, 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 to be believed. Yeah, I, uh, um, I, uh, we were invited. We went to the Mar-a-Lago event that he had a few months ago and where, you know, the president was the prime minister of uh, Brazil that got the coronavirus, that same event. We were there ourselves. And when you see him, you, you see the energy off camera, slightly different than on camera, the way he tells the story. You know, he knows how to win the crowd. And when I went there, I took people that were against him. We took seven guests and we went there, you know, just to kind of see how people would view it. And, uh, you know, very interesting personality who he is. Very, in, I mean, I read Art of the Deal 20 years ago, 19 years ago, and I said, what a great book. And yeah. I got a bunch of copies that I've had for years prior to him being president. I would always give it away to my guys. Hey, learn how to negotiate, read this book. But uh, I don't know. You know, to me, I just think he needs way more secret service than other presidents have needed in the past. I don't know. And I think you know I, what yeah, my family had a meeting with him uh, last November, and um, it turned out to be a 45-minute meeting. Um, and it was very illuminating because 
my, my wife said to him something like, she said, you know, Mr. President, she goes, you're attacked so viciously in the media. An ordinary person would be completely demoralized, would go under his desk. You know, how do you take it? You know, um, and we kind of expected Trump to laugh it off and go, well, you know, I enjoy it. It's hilarious. I love bashing these people and so on. But no, he was, he actually said the unexpected thing. He goes, well, guys, you know, he goes, I got to tell you, just between us, it, it gets to me. He goes, you know, because I'm working, he goes, I'm working really hard for the American people. He goes, I've, we just did this operation against Kasim Soleimani. He goes, it's a very difficult operation. It was carried out to perfection. He goes, but these guys won't give me any credit for anything. Uh, whatever I do must be bad. If I recommend a drug, it's got to be the drug that doesn't work. Uh, if I do an operation, it's got to be the worst operation ever. And so I think he said at the end of the day, it's it's a little, you know, it, it does get to me. And, and I, I for us, it was a... It was seeing a vulnerable side of Trump that we didn't quite expect. And I know my wife was a little startled by it uh, and a little moved by it. Yeah, you know, but, but, I, but I understand that and I, I can fully see that. But at the same time, if you bring in that New York uh, uh, attitude in, you cannot be surprised if that's what's happening. You just cannot be surprised if you're just going after people as quickly, as fast as you are with Twitter and nonstop. You just have to, if you're bullying the bully, you're, you're still hurting the, the other bully that you're bullying, his ego is going to get hurt and it's just going to be constant back and forth. You know, you punch somebody, they're going to punch you back. So it's nonstop going to happen. But, uh, you know, Dinesh, uh, the last thing I was going to ask you is you told a story in the, in your documentary about Saul Linsky back in 1970, I think George, um, senior, Bush senior was given a talk and, you know, protesters were coming in saying, Hey, what's the best way for us to protest? And I'll let you tell the story, but uh, that is a pretty riveting story if that's an accurate story. So what happened when these protesters went and had a meeting with Saul Linsky? And by the way, for some people that don't know who he is, maybe you can elaborate on who he is that gave that advice. Saul Linsky was a political organizer. You can almost call him the original community organizer. He was a, an inspiration to both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Obama, when he graduated from Harvard Law School, uh, went to work for the Alinsky organization. Uh, Hillary Clinton wrote her thesis on Alinsky. So this is a, a figure that has had a huge impact through his influence on other powerful people. And uh, the story is described in the biography of Alinsky by an Alinsky supporter. Uh, it was about how clever Alinsky was in doing political sort of dirty tricks. And in this case, what happened is that George W. H. W. Bush, the father, was giving a speech at the United Nations. Uh, and a group of leftists from the 60s came to Alinsky and they were like, why don't we hold up signs that basically equate George W. Bush with like the Ku Klux Klan? Um, and Alinsky was like, well, that's that's a very crude and stupid thing to do. Um, and of course, you can do it, but it's unimaginative. Here's something more clever. What about if you guys go out to, a, to the local store and buy some white sheets? Uh, why don't you come dressed up as Ku Klux Klansmen yourselves? And then when George H.W. Bush starts speaking, you have all these signs and you jump up and down and you go, we're with Bush, KKK supports Bush. This is much more effective because when, it, when it's seen in the media, well, people will see images, horrific images of people in white hoods supporting Bush. This will do far more damage to Bush's credibility than a group of hippies carrying signs equating Bush. So, so basically, Alinsky was proposing, uh, creating, if you will, a theater, a political theater in which you, you, you manipulate the imagery uh, to, to send a false message. But the false message is believed to be true because of the enormous power of the media. How, how accurate is that statement and how has it been ve verified that that actually was stated? Well, it is in, uh, I believe the source of it is Sanford Horwitz's book called Let Them Call Me Rebel, which is a, this is a progressive leftist writing a full length, the only full length biography uh, of Alinsky. And I believe that is the source. I've documented it and, and footnoted it in my own work, but I believe from memory that that is the source of that particular anecdote. If you could send that to me, I'd like to put the link below because to me, that is just, uh, 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 I mean, divisive, but at the same time, uh, a model that we're seeing a lot of today as well, which uh, it kind of gets the average person to sit there and say, who do you really trust on media? Like, who do you really believe in media when you see different things? Like, who should I trust? Do I trust people on the right? Do I trust left? Do I trust Tucker? Do I trust Anderson? Do I trust 
Maddow? Do I trust Hannity? Who do I trust? It's very tough right now for the average person. I'm not talking about for the person that already has a political affiliation and they've done a lot of reading and due diligence. I'm talking for the 60, 70 percent voter that doesn't follow politics says, I don't know who I trusted. It's a very, very weird time. Well, Dinesh, thank you so much for being a guest on Valuetainment. Folks, I'm going to put the link below to uh, uh, his book, uh, United States of Socialism. And uh, Dinesh, do we have a set date on when the documentary will be coming out? It's been announced for August 7th, but as you know, things are in a little flux with the theater. So we're in close consultation with the with our distributor to figure out the best timing and the best way to release this movie. But it's going to be coming out soon. And it's going to be coming out this summer. We're going to put the link to the documentary as well at the bottom for you to know exactly what date it'll be released. I just watched it and uh, I highly recommend people watch it and make your own opinion about what's uh, being said in there in the documentary. It'll definitely make you think uh, uh, on uh, what is taking place today. Dinesh, I'll give you final thoughts before we wrap up. We are a divided country. Uh, we're divided over very fundamental issues. Uh, I think it's a time for the ordinary citizen to be more involved and more informed than normal, just for the reason you just said, which is to say that these days, we can't automatically take for granted the information that's put out there. A lot of it is manipulated. Some of it is flatly untrue. And so documentaries like mine are aimed at helping you to think in a new way about what's really going on. Very cool. Dinesh, once again, thank you for being a guest on Value Tim. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. So what was your biggest takeaway from this interview? Knowing which way he leans politically, what was your biggest takeaway? Specifically when we talk about socialism against capitalism or the Indian educational system, the ranking of where you're ranked or, you know, different methods of assassination, political, financial and uh, 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 character. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway? I want to hear your thoughts. And if you watch today's interview and the concept of socialism, you're saying, I want to know more about socialism. I sat down with a professor who is a very, very well-known professor, the top Marxist socialistic professor we have in America, Richard Wolff, and we had a friendly debate. If you've never watched it, I highly recommend you watch this debate he and I had. And if you've not watched my sit down with Roger Stone, because he talks about the manipulation of politics and how it works out, if you've not watched this, click over here. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.